Hello, Barbara. Thanks so much for sitting, uh, sitting down with me in this virtual environment after the great presentations we've seen so far. Super happy that you're here with us today. Very, very interesting story to learn a little bit more about you, a little bit more about Byersdorf, which is, of course, a fantastically inspiring and, and pioneering business. And to have a nice chat together about growth. I'm really looking forward to it. For the people who don't know you, which is probably lots of people on the call, can you explain us a little bit about who Barbara is, who Barbara works for, what Barbara likes? Uh, tell us who Barbara is. Mike, thanks so much for the invitation. Really happy to be with you on that growth journey. Um, yeah, growth is a topic um, that somehow has always accompanied me in my life, not only by growing as a person, but also in the environment in which we are in, I'm in. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Barbara, Barbara Wenzel. Um, I'm heading up uh, at Bayersdorf, the global media team, um, being responsible for all our media activations around the world. Um, and I'm with that company for 15 years now. Um, before that, um, Michael I was traveling a little bit around Europe, um, many years in France, um, working for LVMH, um, and before that in Austria which is my home company, uh, my home country, sorry. Um, but um, yeah, so that's a little bit about my very rough pro professional background. Mm -hmm. As a person, I'm a mother of three fortunate, amazing grown up children. Um, and I have a personal topic that really, really drives um, myself since many years. Um, when I was young, I had the intention of I wanted to save the world, a little bit arrogant, especially when you don't know what it means. Um, and in um, a disfortunate situation, um, because of a personal situation with my husband who had a brain stroke eight years ago, um, I had then no further solution than... Um, finding a place for him but then inventing um, a place that didn't exist in germany and they created what we call the house for morgen the house of tomorrow for people who are disabled here in hamburg um, mm. and that takes a lot of my time you ask about what i like what are my hobbies and so on tons but at the moment i'm focusing very much on these three topics mm, makes sense and it's uh, it, it, it's good to hear that you're giving back in that sense it's uh, uh, an interesting story i think barbara um, brings us to Bayersdorf. Let, let's focus on Bayersdorf yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, uh, not, not everybody knows the brand Bayersdorf, but I think there's a fantastic story around pioneering, rebellious culture, people making a real difference behind it. Tell us a little bit about that, because I think I think mm -hmm. people's eyes will open and their ears will open when you uh, when you tell them. First of all, I think what you said was is really interesting. Indeed, nobody knows the brand Bayersdorf because the brand Bayersdorf is not known. Bayersdorf was a gentleman, Paul Bayersdorf. He created in the late uh, 19th century, um, 1882, something like that, um, in Hamburg, um, the first adhesive plaster. Um, but he did not really, he did not really um, promote it like we would do nowadays. Um, but he was the founder of what is Bayersdorf today. So with a plaster, he took that plaster, went to trade fairs and promoted it around the world. So it was sold around the world. And I think in the early 20th century, we were in more than 40 or 45 countries. But in fact, he was somebody who liked to create products, but he was not a marketeer. Um, therefore, the brand Biostoff is not known. A um, couple of years later, like for any startup nowadays, you start something and suddenly you have an investor coming in and making the big thing big. And exactly the same thing happened 100 years ago. So Paul Bayersdorf sold his company to Mr. Toplowitz, a pharmacist as well. So they were all in the same uh, area on, and, and field of knowledge. So pharmacy, chemists, med, uh, and doctors and so on. Um, and Oskar Toplowitz uh, was a pharmacist, as just said. But you know what? He was probably the best marketeer that you could imagine. Because what he did immediately, using, of course, the patent that Bayersdorf already had, um, was creating other brands. Um, he found another person, um, Mr. Lifschutz, uh, who identified and isolated an emulsifier, Userit, and that was the beginning of the Nivea cream because it was the application of that emulsion um, for dermatology. 1911, we have to think that. And, and Toplowitz um, was, um, he had this genius of marketing and of branding and they, I, they gave the name, the brand um, or the products the name Nivea. He started. He has a patent on the brand, um, and they started to launch everything under Nivea and started to make it really, really big. 
um, and that lasted on. And then in, um, I just told you earlier on um, that for hair, we have products since 1912, we have powder since 1912 and so on. Then there were men products coming out and there was a first sun cream coming out all this um, just before the first world, world war. Then the first world war happened. And of course there was a kind of stop. They took up again after the first world war. And you all know, I think this one here, the Nivea cream, um, this blue, is existing since 1925 can you imagine 1925 oh. and it's always also there it's still there and it will go with us in the in the next hundred years i'm sure mm -hmm. so um this was the first thing about what is really interesting about um uh, about bias of he, he was not he was the founder but not the marketeer and the brand that everybody knows nowadays from the company bias is clearly nivea we also yeah. have some other brands we have la prairie People don't know that so much. We have, of course, Hansaplast. In many countries, it's Leucoplast or um, Elastoplast, also in the mm -hmm. French-speaking countries. Um, we have Tesa, who is a B2B business. Um, and at the moment, we have a lot of small startups again, idea, uh, uh, creators, innovators. Um, we recently launched um, a digital-only um, product, which is called OWN, which is really adapting um, the skin to the skincare needs of women nowadays and in the online sphere. So that's um, that's a little bit the story on on Biosdorf, but Nivea is the brand mm. that everybody knows. Yeah. Another thing, perhaps, which uh, you might probably not know, because um, we all know Nivea, but what we don't know about Nivea is that thanks to this um, international expansion that uh, Mr. Biosdorf already had, um, Nivea could build on that internationality. Um, and after the second world war, where everybody thought, my God, now it's going to stop. Um, the brand was already present in more than 45 mm -hmm. countries. Um, the company or Germany being the war loser had to sell brands, companies and so on to the other countries. And so the brand also Nivea was part of that and was sold out to many, many people in UK. In UK it was uh, Smith mm -hmm. and Nephew and since uh, buying the brand and it yeah. took the company then until the late uh, or early 90s to rebuy the brand and reown the brand the enormous advantage of that bad situation in those days was uh, michael that um, everybody in each and every country of this world has the impression that this thing here belongs to his and her country so we are very very close to our consumers since yeah. ever in that case by misfortune but the misfortune turned out to be a fortune and i think that's what is still valid nowadays in um, in any kind of of startup you have up and downs you have an investor coming in something happens then something else happens and at one point it really becomes a big thing and it can go on yeah it's an amazing yeah. story i mean ultimately there's real there's two really interesting takeaways right i think the marketing of skin cream in a blue tin with such an iconic color is amazing and it was a it was a world first that it happened and indeed, when you think about Nivea, it's, it's almost the ultimate scale up, right? Finding yeah. a product, getting it to work, getting an MVP that's really good, scaling it up, and then yeah. the trials and tribulations of life and business happens and still thrive, move forward and innovate. It's, yeah. it's a really interesting story. And I think what it ties down to is, and that, that comes to my next question as well, is, is behind every brand and behind every concept yeah. is a story and a team behind it, right? And what I'm wondering, also in these interesting times we live in, what do you think are these ingredients that go into growing these super successful teams, right? Outside of profit, when it comes to culture, when it comes yeah. to building teams, when it comes to diversity and leadership, yeah. what are your thoughts around that? And, and what are your views on, on those elements yeah. as in key drivers of successful growth? Mm, very, very good question, Michael. Um, well, I think at least what we know of those gentlemen and what we certainly know of the people active today in the world is that if you have, you, you need to be a kind of pioneer. You need to have a lot of curiosity. You need to be willing to go beyond what exists already and invent the unknown. Um, the gentleman definitely had that. And um, you need to be willing also to take risks because uh, you, you, identify this blue and you identify a name and then you make it big but you don't know whether it's going to happen but if your gut feelings are there and if you trust in what you are doing what your team is doing and that you work i just said at the beginning there were three gentlemen working together they were each of them had a different asset they knew something different but they brought it together and i think this collaborative team spirit that they had 120 years ago is still something which we need today when we want to 
grow things. So that's uh, curiosity, risk taking, capabilities of team building, being a team player, being truly collaborative. Mm -hmm. These are really the ingredients for any kind of of success. Yeah. And that comes along, of course, with trust, because you have to trust the people in which you're in. And um, um, yeah, for me, I think um, these are the, the main factors and have and the spirit. That's alive in the company today, that spirit of pioneering and advancing and, and, and really driving these things. Do you yeah. put it in the teams that, that, that sit around you or, or, or that you manage? Yeah, because I mean, we, we have very strong company values which are building and fostering on, 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 those, on those items. It's courage, simplicity, trust, and care. Mm -hmm. um, courage is all what I just said. Yep. Um, care is the collaborative spirit. Yes, people are, have that spirit. And if you look at the story also of Nivea, um, in the 50s, we came up um, with um, uh, the sun cream. And we had the first advertising, those of you who are a little bit older, uh, you might remember, you might remember from your parents, um, there was the first lady in a white bikini in the 50s. You know where women were standing in the 50s. We had to ask our husbands whether we were allowed to vote, whether we were allowed to go to work and so on. And Nivea showcased the women in a bikini. <laughs> and we always had this kind of approach. Yes, it's, it's something which is really embedded in the culture of the company. Yeah, it's amazing. Of the people. Yeah. yeah, I think because I think many companies look for that forever, but they never find it because it's not genuinely in their DNA, right? But if you have it something in there, that's that's really good. Switching to a bit more of a of a plugged in business perspective from uh, yeah, yeah. from your side, because of course you're you're one of the business leaders in Bayersdorf, looking after amazing brands with 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 fantastic growth targets. If you look at how you've built those teams yourself, what are what are typical pitfalls you would tell you would tell other companies or 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 people listening to you right now to look out for? What are what are particular things where you're like, well, you know, we could have done that better. Those are those are things I should do differently now with all the experience that you have and all the knowledge that you have, this is what I would have done differently. That's always an interesting one as well, I think. I love that. That's the one that you have in interviews and I haven't interviewed for so long. <laughs> so <laughs> not an easy one to answer. Um, I think what I have, would, what I personally would never do differently, and I start with that, yep. is I always reflect on what I have been doing, whether it was okay, whether it was not okay. And not in the negative sense of questioning, but in the positive and constructive sense. And I had situations in my life, and here I'm coming, it's very personal, Michael, now, um, where, of course, um, I was running and not questioning anything. When my husband had that brain stroke, um, I was just doing, doing, doing. And certainly I made a lot of errors. Now, if with the knowledge that I have nowadays in such a difficult situation, um, I would step at, uh, I would take a step back, give me a couple of minutes just to reflect instead of starting running. And that's something I could advise to anybody. We are all, and especially also with the COVID situation which we are in right now, uh, we are all in a new situation. The pandemic is taking a lot away from us sometimes also giving us something new, but um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a tournament and we are, in, we are in, in new grounds. And instead of starting running with the old patterns that we have, let's step back, reflect a, a, a moment and then only go on, not start running before you have reflected and think, thought about. Yeah, I think as an industry, yeah, it's, it, it, you make a really good point because as an industry, I think that's one of the challenges we have as a whole. Yeah. We, we go way too fast, right? And yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can't all live by Facebook mantra of go fast and break things. You should maybe yeah. go a bit slower, not break things, but make sure you do the right thing on the mid to long term. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, uh, one last question I have can be a quick one. When, when we talk about di digitalization of your business, of course, that's that's one of the main pillars you're you're looking at. Is there anything that you see on horizon that's that's interesting to share? There, interesting to 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 see happening in terms of trends. I can imagine with COVID that e-commerce is more important. A lot of movements happening around there. Any 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 things you can say about that? Well, guys, you are the digital ones, and I think you know it better than we do. But what <laughs> we see, of course, is that COVID has accelerated everything. Yeah. Um, and um, now digitalization as a trend is now, I think, 25 years old. Um, and probably at the momentum, uh, we have taken a speed where in a in couple of months we, we, we gain ages and years. Uh, what we do see, and um, Kantar and Forrester always all, all predict that, is that um, all commerce will be digitally driven in the next 20 to 25 years. 
Whether that will really be happening, we will see, because there's also the sustainability aspect of digitalization. What is about the energy? These are aspects which are not fully, fully clear now. Nevertheless, it's clear that um, we are in a digital world. Yes. And as as our the founders of Biostoff took the in the, in the industrial revolution for bringing them to life and and bringing their products to life and having those those. Uh, inventions we are now in the same situation of being able to invent and it will it's there it will stay the question is how we are going to 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 manage it still in that reflective way i think but it's there i agree it's uh, uh you're right we are embarking on a very interesting journey of, of digitalization hypercharged i would say yeah uh, and it's fantastic to see that these brands that are well 140 150 years old almost are taking that leap and and are there with us Barbara, thank you very much. This is all the time we have. Super inspirational story. Uh, really liked uh, understanding more about Nivea. Really liked understanding more about you personally.